thank you for coming this morning. Um, so today we have the dissertation defense for Jillian Howard. Uh, for those who don't know, Jillian is a PhD candidate in the ICON program. So, um, and uh, I was trying to think, you know, you always try and find interesting or opportun opportunities in this moment to embarrass your grad students, right? And it's very, because they're already relaxed and everything's kind of chill and everything. I'm sure she slept a lot in the last 48 hours or so. But I um, actually don't have really any kind of, like, it's really impossible to dig up these kind of things on uh, Jillian. So I just thought I would point out that um, the work you're about to, to hear about has been a true grind. Uh, this project, I think, uh, was way more challenging than either of us anticipated, uh, yep. working on an eight-year data set and, uh, and everything, and contributing to collecting the data over the last three years. And the one thing that's probably not apparent from the talk, having walked through it with her, is that most of the data you're about to see collected it occurs between about 9.30 p.m. and 4 a.m. Wow. For months, several days a month, for months mm -hmm. and months and months, for, year, for eight years. And so, it, it does all kinds of things to your psyche, and, and uh, it's not healthy. Uh, but we, you know, it's the price we pay. Um, but and Jillian is the first person to really try and take a stab at, at um, getting a hold of this data. Um, and uh, one of the things I think that's very, been very impressive about it is just how diligent and relentless she had been. Some things we thought might take six months have taken three years yes, to try and tackle, they have. and uh, and she has stuck with it uh, admirably. So. I think uh, I'm really excited for you guys to get to see finally the success we've had in beginning to yeah. tell a story with this data. So, Jillian, the floor is all yours. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this presentation is called Modeling the Effects of Climate on Salamander Demography for Conservation Planning. Um, so, we're going to start with the importance of population modeling. Um, we know that we need models of, of wildlife population dynamics because this is how we understand what's going on right now in wildlife populations and it's also how we're able to make predictions about population responses to changing environmental conditions in the future. These models should be robust and mechanistic so that we can actually use them to inform management decisions and feel relatively confident about them. Um, but robust models require rigorous estimates of vital rates and for many taxa these kinds of estimates are lacking. So for example, plethodon and salamanders are this group of organisms. They're really diverse. Um, they're one of the most studied amphibian groups. The family contains about 470 species across the Americas, Europe, and Asia. All of them are lungless, so they rely on cool, moist conditions to facilitate gas exchange across the surface of their skin, which really makes you think twice about picking them up, because it's sort of like, you know, someone's petting your lungs, kind of <laughs> gross. Anyway, um, in rich temperate forests, like what we have here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, um, plethodonid biomass can exceed that of birds and mammals combined on a per square meter basis, so that's pretty significant. And as part of the result of this high abundance and density, they play these key roles in nutrient cycling and trophic structure in forest ecosystems. So they actually do matter, even though they're so little. <clears throat> And yet, despite their importance and how well studied they are, we can't build a population model for this group, which is kind of crazy. So our objectives in this dissertation, or my objectives in this dissertation, were to review the state of the current literature, to generate robust estimates of key vital rates and their sensitivity to climate, and to project population growth rate in space or time. So this means across a landscape or at target localities for conservation, and also to forecast population response to changing climate. Um, and then, finally, I tried to couple salamander ecology with human values about conservation land use in the study region. So, first I did this review and synthesis of estimated vital rates for terrestrial salamanders in the family Plethodon today. So, I conducted this literature review and I focused on temperate North American species that are direct developing. That means that they lay their eggs on land in burrows underground and the eggs hatch into fully, you know, miniature adult guys. They don't have any larval stage, they don't require an aquatic habitat, they don't migrate to ponds, nothing like that. So they're kind of unusual. Um, and then, so the genera we looked at are Aeneides, Desmognathus, only two species. Both of them are these really miniature little guys, or miniaturized. Um, we looked at Encetina, uh, Plethodon, and also Phagnathus, which is uh, this funny looking guy up here. He's pretty closely related to the Desmognathus. <clears throat> and then we tested for predictive patterns among these rates. So we used a regression analysis when there were a lot of estimates to try and get at these patterns, and then we just used visual inspection of plots when there were only a few estimates. 
We also tested the plausibility of rates using a Leslie matrix model for sensitivity analysis, and we built some really interesting isocline plots that let us look at how, um, when you hold a population growth rate at a stable level, how you can sort of change the rates and, and uh, still get a stable population growth rate, but at many different rate levels. So this is a generic life cycle diagram for the Plethodontinae clade, which is the one that's marked with the little red dot there. Um, and basically, you have animals moving through these life stages. So if we start with adults over here, um, adults survive, but they, re they stay in the same life stage. So it's kind of like this cyclic process of survival and remaining in the same stage. Additionally, they produce offspring. So they have this fecundity term that goes over here and produces hatchlings. The fecundity term includes things like clutch size, clutch frequency, and hatch rate, which is an egg survival value. Um, and then hatchlings survive to become juveniles, juveniles survive to become subadults, and subadults survive to become adults. So what are the key results of this literature review? Well, including just the five genera of direct developing plethodontinae that we were looking at, there are 5,276 studies that have been published. But for the arrows in this life history diagram, there are really only a few reports. So clutch size is the most well-reported value. This is all components of the fecundity term up here. There are 161 published reports of clutch size in these species, or these genera. Um, clutch frequency, which is also part of fecundity, is also fairly well reported with, with 40 published reports. But for hatch rate, we only have nine reliable published reports. And then when you get into age or stage-specific survival, we only really have five published reports that give us specific survival rates for each size. Otherwise, we have nine reports that give us either only adult survival or a population, enti an entire population survival estimate. And those are not very useful when we're trying to, to understand you know, the actual dynamics that are happening in the population here. So are there any predictive relationships for survival that we found? Well, going back to classical life history theory, we might think that annual probability of survival should be higher if your age at maturity is greater. Because if you took a long time to reach maturity, then you should live for a while so that that investment was worth it, right? So you should have higher survival when you get to be an adult. And the same thing with um, snout vent length at maturity. That's this body size measurement for salamanders. The larger that is, the longer it probably took you to reach maturity, and so the higher your adult survival should be. So <clears throat> we would expect these kinds of relationships, right? These pretty one-to-one -one relationships between the annual probability of adult survival and these age and size and maturity. <clears throat> but instead what we see is this kind of pattern among survival estimates. It's, it doesn't really look like it's doing what we would expect it to do. So that's kind of hard to think that we might be able to predict survival from these, from these, uh, from these other rates, right? Okay, so are there other predictive relationships for survival that we could look at? So we wondered if maybe there's something going on with the studies, right? So maybe duration of the study has something to do with, with how survival is going to be estimated, right? So we might ex we might expect that you know, when you've only done a short-term study and your sample size is small, there's a lot of variation, right? And so there might be this wider spread of values among those studies that are short duration. Whereas when you get out to these longer duration studies, you know, maybe there's some sort of convergence among estimates. Um, so that's one thing we thought we might see, which is why we've plotted here study duration and the reported annual survival rate. Um, we also wondered if there were some sort of connection between the genus. So we have here, we have things coded according to genus. And then we also wondered if maybe the really low survival rates we saw have to do with studies being conducted in a disturbed habitat where survival is really actually affected. <clears throat> However, this is what the data looks like. It really doesn't seem like any of those things I just talked about are happening. It might be that there's some convergence happening here because we aren't getting really low survival estimates out here, but there's only one study that was five years long. There are a few studies that were four years long, but we don't have a ton of data out there to really say conclusively, oh yeah, there's some convergence happening there among rates. So I would feel uncomfortable you know, saying, oh yeah, there's a really strong predictive relationship here and you can totally, yeah, sure, you know. I would feel uncomfortable saying that. I don't think there's anything going on here that we can really talk about. <clears throat> and another thing to point out is that four is about the age of maturity for a lot of these species, four years. And most studies are for less than four years, which means that the study is not even following a cohort, you know, from the time that it's born to the time that it matures. And it's certainly not following a cohort for an entire generation time, right? So that's also problematic. We're not getting a really wide range of, of or the full range of life history events for any given individual set of animals. 
Okay, so then we asked, are there some predictive relationships for age at maturity? Um, kind of like I talked about with survival, you might expect that animals that have a larger snout vent length at maturity are going to mature later because it takes time to grow, right? And additionally, kind of related to that, we might think that if the latitude of the population is high, that is, if it's like closer to Canada than to the equator, right, that we might see um, this delayed age at maturity simply because the closer you are to higher latitudes, the shorter the active season is for salamanders. And if the active season is shorter, then it takes them longer, more years to acquire enough resources to grow and mature, right? <clears throat> so we did this multiple regression analysis that looked at both of these variables. I don't know if you guys can even see that. It's down here in this corner. The adjusted R squared value is 0.339, which is not bad considering that we're just looking at two factors, you know, in this regression. Um, and it's kind of a complicated thing. But this is what we got. So it looks like there is some relationship with both of these things. You could maybe sort of generally predict what the age at maturity is going to be for your population if you knew what the body size at maturity was and if you know the latitude of your population, which is relatively easy to find out. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then we asked, are there predictive relationships for clutch frequency? Clutch frequency refers to the proportion of females in the population that are breeding in a given year. Um, these are capital breeding animals, which means that they have a specific time of year when they breed. For our guys up in the Southern Appalachians, it's spring. It's like May and June is typical. Um, and so what that means is that for the rest of the year, they're kind of accumulating resources. And then right then in the spring, when it's time to breed, if they have enough resources to produce a clutch of eggs, they will do so. But if they don't, then they're going to wait an entire other year until they have more capital and they can actually produce a clutch. Because for them, it's not just the cost of producing the eggs, they're also committing to about two months of time that they spend underground sitting with these eggs and you know making sure nothing eats them and making sure they don't get moldy and all that sort of thing so you might think again that as latitude increases the, the annual probability of reproduction is going to decrease right because it takes a longer time to acquire the resources to yoke the clutch okay so we did this regression and we got an r squared of 0.291 again it's not great but it's decent um, and we do see this declining relationship between the probability of reproduction and the latitude of the population. So it does look like what we expected might be happening here. Okay, so then we asked, are there predictive, oh, I didn't change it. This is supposed to be clutch size, not clutch frequency. Sorry about that. Just in your mind, just change that. Um, okay, so we said, a larger animal should have a larger clutch size because its body is bigger and the egg size is fairly standard among the species and so you would think that you could fit more eggs in a larger animal, right? So again, we ran this linear regression and we got the R squared of 0 0.160, which is kind of bad. Like compared to our other ones, it's about half of what those other relationships were. So when you look at it, you get this one outlying point right here. And it happens to be this funny looking guy over here. This is Phagnathus hubricti. Um, they live down in the Alabama Red Hills and they happen to have one of the largest body sizes in this group, but one of the smaller clutch sizes. So they're kind of an anomaly. Um, so we ran the regression again with Phagnathus removed and we have a much better R squared value and we have a much steeper slope. So it looks like maybe Phagnathus is just kind of a weirdo and we can just kind of ignore him and say aside from that guy, this is what's happening, probably. Okay, so then we moved on to testing the plausibility of these rates. Um, so we developed, we created this Leslie matrix model based on this life, uh, this life history diagram, right? And so the way that it works is that, okay, if you're, if you're a year one animal and you're transitioning to year two, right, you're going to have this survival value applied to you. And so if you're a year two animal and you're transitioning to year three, then you're experiencing this survival. And it goes on like that. So if you're an adult down here, you're experiencing this survival. And then there are also three classes, three age classes that are reproducing. And so we have this fecundity term times their survival values to indicate the amount of hatchlings that are being produced by those classes. <clears throat> and here, this F, the fecundity value is clutch size times clutch frequency times hatch rate and offspring sex ratio, which we assume to be 0.5 because these animals are heterogametic, which means that unlike turtles, for example, you know, the number of males and females in the clutch is not determined by temperature or some other environmental factor. It's actually genetically determined or, yeah, genetically determined. Um, okay, so that's what that looks like. Oh, look, I made this to talk about just what I was saying. <laughs> 
Super. OK, so here we go. We're connecting the life history diagram here to the things in the table. So you can see these really nicely colored circles someone made because they were thinking ahead. There we go. All right. And there's our fecundity terms. Just what I was describing. Isn't that nice? OK, so we ran a sensitivity analysis using that Leslie matrix model, which shows that um, adult survival, or older adult survival specifically, uh, a young size class survival, annual clutch frequency, and hatch rate are probably our most sensitive rates here. So that's interesting for a number of reasons. One, because you know, this means that those mature adults are really important in the population, right? So once they reach maturity, they need to really stick around for a while because their survival is so influential on the population growth rate, right? But additionally, recruitment is also really important. You know, the, the, the fact that we need these young guys to survive also so that we can get recruitment into the population. Um, and then, interestingly, annual clutch frequency is also really impactful. So, well, you may say, okay, whatever. But imagine that things are getting drier, say. Say that there's a drought regime that's starting because of climate change, right? And so say that things are generally drier. Say maybe our active season is reduced, right? So now we can kind of see that maybe annual clutch frequency could be really significant to population growth rate if something like drought was reducing the foraging period and reducing the amount of times that a female can reproduce, right? So that's really interesting. Additionally, hatch rate is coming up with high sensitivity. Now, hatch rate is one of the more latent rates that we have. You might have noticed I didn't show you any graphs of hatch rate. That's because there are so few estimates and they're so unreliable that there's really no point even talking about them. Um, and so it's sort of troubling that there's high sensitivity in this rate that we know so little about. Oh, look, I talked about that, too. I'm going to remember to press the button. Even if I don't know what it is, I'm just going to press it. OK, so then we created these stable population growth isoclines for hatch rate and clutch frequency. Um, and so I'm going to explain these relatively piece by piece, because they get a little confusing. So down here on the x-axis, we have this adult year 6 plus survival. And over here on the y-axis, for all the graphs, we have this year 2 survival. Um, and then this plot is going to have the hatch rate of 0.3 this one of 0.5, and this one of 0.75. And then I'm going to add on to there. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's. Could be calling in. Somebody well, tell to them call. to hang up. <laughs> I'm just going to ignore it. I hope it doesn't bother anyone. OK. Um, and so then we're going to have these five isoclines show up on each plot that's going to have these different clutch frequency values. OK. So let's start with. This is the clutch frequency of one. This assumes that all the females are reproducing every year. <clears throat> and so you can see when hatch rate is 0.3, when it's low, the, this isocline is much farther to the right. Okay? And over here, where hatch rate is pretty high, this isocline is farther to the left. So what's really going on here is that you're getting these different kind of balances between the two survival rates, okay? So here we're saying, you know, adult survival is 0.6, right? And when hatch rate is 0.3, we're, we have to have a juvenile survival of 0.9 to balance our population, to get stable population growth, okay? But here, we can have this adult survival rate of 0.6, and we can, we can get by with a, with a juvenile survival of about 0.5, right? Because we have this much higher hatch rate. So we can still balance the population, but at a lower level of juvenile survival. And going on in that vein, this is just a little bit more so that way, right? You can have even lower juvenile survival because your hatch rate is higher. So, you can look at different rates within each isocline as well. So here we have the high, a higher adult survival rate of 0.8, and now we can do with a 0.55 rate for juveniles. So that's how the isoclines work. So then we overlaid all the estimates from the literature of these survival rates that we have, OK? So this is the mean rate here, but all these other points, sorry, all these other points are, are from specific studies. And so just looking at that one isocline, you can see there's, there's only a few rates that are really falling on or near the isocline. Rates that are falling on or near the isocline are probably capable of producing a stable population, right? But ones that are here to the left are not producing a stable population. They're producing declining populations. And ones that are here to the right are producing growing populations. So now I'm going to add all the isoclines in. And what you can see is that when hatch rate is very low, most of the rates can't produce stable or growing populations. But over here, when hatch rate is pretty high, a lot of the rates are maybe reasonable. So we think that reality, oh, sorry. These three ones, these three rates here, 
are on the left of all the isoclines in basically every combination of values. So those are probably what we might call garbage rates, right? They're not working ever. They're not working under any of the scenarios that we estimated. So that's problematic that there are these estimates out there in the literature that are really profoundly unplausible, right? Or implausible. Um, so that's something to think about. So we think that reality might be sort of here, where Hatchard is 0.5 and the clutch frequency is 0.5 to points or 0.33 to 0.75. So that means that there are about five uh, rate estimates out there in the world that are probably reasonable or plausible. And that's really kind of terrible. You know, if there are this many rates out there, but only these few are really reasonable rates, then we really don't know much about what these populations are doing. And so we also looked at stable population growth isoclines for clutch size, just because we were interested in how, you know, sort of this balancing between adult and juvenile survival um, would change as clutch size increases. But it's, it's sort of similar to the other ones in that there's really only about five or six rates here in the middle that seem plausible, even at these highly variable levels of clutch size from four to 16 eggs. So you might be asking, well, why did somebody publish these implausible rates? The reason is because they didn't test them. People will come up with these rates and then they publish them, but there's really, no, there's really no process for seeing, okay, are these rates actually reasonable, which is kind of surprising. We found one study that actually tested their own rates in a matrix model and provided a population growth rate, but that was the only one. All these other studies, about 14, did not provide any sort of assessment of the plausibility of their rates. So we really need more estimates of error around rate estimates or more majors of error around rate estimates when they're published, and we also need tests of plausibility of rates to be published with these rates. <clears throat> so we would recommend, or I would recommend, that rates should be published in a should be examined in a population viability analysis or some kind of plausibility analysis like what we did. <clears throat> so, is there any transferability of vital rate estimates among species and populations given those comparison plots that we made? It depends on the rate, right? Agent maturity appears to increase with snout vent length at maturity and with the population latitude. Annual clutch frequency appears to decline with increasing population latitude. Clutch size appears to increase with body size. But survival doesn't really correlate by genus with other vital rates or by study methods or the duration of this study. We found that survival estimates were highly variable, and so we have to say that transferability is really unclear and is difficult to predict right now. Um, and similarly, there's really not enough reliable hatch rate data to assess transferability. Estimation of hatch rate is difficult because a lot of species lay their eggs deep underground where it's inaccessible and you can't observe them. And the ones that lay their eggs more shallowly when you break open a log or a flip a rock or something, you're really changing the microclimate environment of that brooding site. And so you don't really know if the hatch rate that you observe is real or not. It's really hard to tell. Um, but it does seem like from our isocline analyses that a wide range of rates are plausible, a wide range of hatch rates, which is sort of interesting. Okay, so some recommendations for how survival estimation should be done for these and other wildlife taxa. Well, we should be collecting long-term data, right? We want to try to capture how rates change over the lifespan of an organism, at least over a generation time, right? At least from the time an animal is born until the time it reaches maturity. Um, we want to be able to have the potential to track survival of these cohorts of known age individuals. And like I said, many studies are shorter than a single generation, and few have been long enough to track a single cohort to maturity. So we also want to use methods that account for low detectability and high temporary immigration rate, which is a big problem with salamanders. And um, some studies did use older methods, like creating life tables and things like that, which really don't account for these things. OK, so then we decided to look at population plethoron population dynamics from our own demographic data. And what we've found is that there's this strong linkage between fine scale variation in precipitation and population dynamics. So we used capture mark recapture data to estimate some weather induced variation in size class specific survival rates. We also did a fecundity study to determine mean clutch size and clutch frequency. We parameterized a stage based matrix model that actually allowed us to project population growth across the landscape under both current and future climate scenarios. And then we compared this projected population growth data in our study area to some abundance estimates we made from count data that we collected across a precipitation gradient in our study area. Yes, it was a lot of steps. OK, so this is the wider region around our study area. Um, this is Coweta, the Coweta LTER, the Coweta Basin, this little red area here. This white outline shows the ma so Macon County in North Carolina. Um, and then 
what we're showing here is this mean daily precipitation averaged over the last 30 years. Um, and so you can see the study area is really in this very, very wet area. Um, and that's great for salamanders. So zooming in a little bit, this shows the soil moisture index and the precipitation layer. And you can see that Coweta down here is really nicely situated in this precipitation gradient, right? Um, there does seem to be a much drier area up here in this part of the county, but there's also pretty wet areas here. And this part here might be somewhat suitable for salamanders too, you might think. So this is just zooming in a little bit more on Coweta. Um, these are our capture mark recapture sites, the green dots. The black dots represent places, the sort of general vicinity where we collected animals for the fecundity study. Um, and the red dots are where we collected count data. So again, these are our CMR plots. They're here in this place that's really, really wet based on the precipitation gradient, but it's also really, really wet based on the soil moisture index. So it's kind of at the base of a bunch of slopes. Um, it's, there's a creek that runs really close to it. Soils up there really hold moisture well. So it's a very wet place, very suitable for salamanders. So we use three different data sets. The primary data set is this eight-year capture mark recapture study of Plethodon shermani, Plethodon teahali hybrid salamanders. We have in our data set 40 primary periods with 118 secondary periods. In a robust design, what you have are primary periods composed of secondary periods. So you do these repeated capture, or repeated, yeah, repeated sampling occasions within a short period of time. And over that period of time, you can assume that your population is closed to births, deaths, immigration, emigration. And then between primary periods, you can let the population be open to those processes. Um, and it lets you estimate things like detectability and um, temporary immigration rates, which, like I said, are really important in salamander populations. So currently, we have 2,138 marked individuals. We have 5,946 total captures. 64% of our marked animals have been recaptured at least once. And the most recaptured individual has been seen 18 times. The longest interval between a capture was five years for an individual, which is really crazy if you consider that our plots are like 100 square meters. To go up there, repeat for five years and not see this guy that we marked and then he's not dead he actually just wasn't there at that moment that's crazy and it may, it's part of the reason that this data is so hard to model right that we have these ridiculous probabilities of survival you know even though we're not capturing them okay so then we did this three-year fecundity study where we preserved and dissected 329 specimens um, and we also made 80 live observations. So the thing about these salamanders is that some of them have really dark stomach skin and you can't see their eggs, but some of them have light stomach skin and you can. So when we could count it in live animals, we did. But when we couldn't, we collected animals and dissected them later. We also did a two-year repeated count study. Those are those plots that are located across the basin, across this precipitation gradient. Um, we have six primary periods and 18 secondary periods for this data set, 1,391 total captures, and we sorted them by life stage as we caught them. So we have counts specifically of juveniles, hatchlings, um, subadults, and adults. And then we modeled them separately so that we could get these specific abundances for each size class. So for the size class specific survival estimates from the capture mark recapture data, we created a Bayesian robust design model. It estimates 28 day survival and temporary immigration or availability. And it estimates detection probability for each secondary period. So for each sampling occasion, we're estimating what the detection probability was. And then we used a time varying individual snout vent length covariate, which is like the key part of this model. Um, so basically we created a von, a von Bertalanffy growth model of known age individuals, which allowed us to say, Okay, an animal of, that, is, that is about 20 months old, and I know months is weird, but that's, it made it more exact. An animal that's about 20 months old is gonna be somewhere in this band of, um, of snout vent length measurements, right? And so you can see these really nice break points where as it gets, there's sort of these units of everybody who's about that age is sort of in this range of sizes, right? And so from that we were able to say, okay, even if we didn't capture an animal, we know that it was you know, size X at the last time we caught it, and it's been so many months since then. So we can estimate what it probably measures now. And so we were able to fill in these blanks artificially, even though we didn't capture animals on every occasion. <clears throat> and that's what allowed us to use this Bayesian model to estimate these size-specific survival rates. So that's why it's the key. Um, we also allowed survival to vary with relatively fine scale precipitate or variation in mean daily precipitation. <clears throat> and what this produced was these really nice logistic curves, right? Sorry, the red line is the mean daily precipitation at the CMR sites. So you can actually see this is for hatchlings, this particular curve. So you can see that it's this logistic relationship. And 
if the place was wetter than our CMR sites, which is possible, I suppose, um, then they might actually have higher survival than what we observed. So this is the plot for juveniles, this is the one for subadults, and this is the one for adults. So what you can see is there's differential survival among size classes, right? And survival is increasing as mean daily precipitation increases. So those are the key takeaways from that. Um, and then these logistic equations are really nicely tying survival to this variation in precipitation. So then we were able to use these equations in a model to project the survival rates across landscapes where we know what mean daily precipitation is. Okay. So for the fecundity estimation, we collected and dissected adult female salamanders. We observed clutches in live females if they had that pale stomach skin. We measured the snout vent length and follicle diameter. We recorded the date that the animal was captured and we counted the total number of follicles. And you can see in this individual, follicles are really different sized a lot of times. So this one has like three little tiny follicles, it's got some good sized ones, and it's got some sort of medium range ones. And this creates all kinds of problems when you're trying to estimate what the final clutch size is going to be. Like, are these little eggs going to be reabsorbed or are they going to be, you know, are they going to turn into large eggs? I don't, I don't really know, you know. It's very hard to say and there, there are many papers about this where people are trying to figure out, you know, okay, well we're going to have a cutoff point here at this size of follicle and anyway, it's very, it's very difficult and subjective. So what we did instead was we developed this regression analysis where we said final clutch size or C, and this is a regression we actually ran, that's why it actually has numbers in it, is equal to you know, this intercept and this coefficient times the snout vent length and this coefficient times the egg diameter, or I mean, sorry, the date that the animal was captured and this, co or this coefficient times um, the follicle diameter. And basically what it allows us to do is use the data on follicles, no matter what size the follicles are, which is really helpful. <clears throat> and what we finally calculated was this mean final clutch size across the observed snout vent lengths of approximately 18 eggs with a range from three to 34 and a standard deviation of nine. So we also found that the proportion of females that were gravid out of our samples was 0.422. So we called this our annual clutch frequency. We were not able to estimate hatch rate because obviously we didn't observe any nests. Nobody's ever seen them for the species that we study. Um, so we used the mean rate from the literature, which is sort of questionable given how unreliable those studies are. But that's what we used because it's all we really had. <clears throat> Okay, then we estimated size class specific abundance from count data. We used package unmarked general binomial and mixture model to estimate abundance detection and availability. And this is really great because now we're estimating abundance accounting for the fact that there's unequal detection among occasions and that availability is really variable. That's the temporary immigration quantity. Um, and so we uh, we modeled initial abundance as varying by site-specific mean total annual precipitation so that we were saying, okay, let's have abundance be based on how wet the site is in general over time on average, right? Okay, so we had spatial replication, we had these multiple plots spread over this precipitation gradient, and we also had temporal replication because we were, we were sampling on multiple occasions over two years. So then we have these estimated abundances that are a very wettest site, where we have these relatively large quantities of each size class, and this is sort of what the breakdown looks like, where we have um, adults being yellow and uh, subadults being red, these are juveniles in black, and the hatchlings are in white. So then we compare this to the estimated abundances at our driest site. So now you can see that the proportion of adults is like 50%. Whereas you have this tiny quantity of hatchlings, this relatively small quantity, I think it's actually one hatchling, yeah, one hatchling, um, this small number of juveniles and this small number of subadults. So that kind of confirms what's been reported in the literature um, by people who have looked at, you know, population structure at dry places for salamanders, which is that, you know, adults can hack it in these crappy environments, right? But these little guys, because they're small, they have a high surface area to volume ratio, they dehydrate really rapidly and then they die. They just can't handle it. It's too unpleasant for them. Um, and so it was really cool to see that show up in these abundance estimates, that same kind of breakdown among the size classes. Okay, so then we looked at rate sensitivity. And to do that, we again created a deterministic females-only stage-based matrix population model, very much like we did when we were looking at the data from the literature. <clears throat> we used those mean size class specific annual survival rates from the Bayesian robust design model. We used the clutch size and clutch frequency we estimated from the fecundity study. We used the mean hatch rate from the literature even though we really wish that we didn't have to. We used the offspring sex ratio of 0.5, which again is because they're heterogametic, et cetera, et cetera. And then we ran this sensitivity analysis using the R package pop bio. We also created stable population isoclines examining the relationships between the most sensitive rates. I expected a different slide there, but this is fine. Um, 
So the most sensitive rates is very similar to in the literature review. We had adult survival, we had hatchling survival, we had hatch rate, and we had clutch frequency. They were the same most sensitive rates. And so again, we built these isoclines where you have clutch frequency uh, decreasing. This is a clutch frequency of one, and this is a clutch frequency of 0.2. Um, and this point up here, these are the actual rates that we used in the model from our Bayesian, or I mean, in the, in the matrix model from our Bayesian estimates. So basically what it shows is that this is a pretty high estimate. Um, our survival might be a little higher than reality, potentially. Or something crazy could be happening, you know, with that hatch rate that we know isn't really that accurate. Um, but in any case, this is, this are the, these are the rates that we estimated from the Bayesian population model, and they fall in the growing population category, which is fine. Okay, so then we did this landscape projection of population growth rates. So this is a fairly complicated modified matrix model, so I'm going to walk through it step by step. The first part of this model is that we set a probability of drought year occurring. So we set it either to 0%, 24%, 32%, or a 50% chance of a drought year. Where a 50% chance would be every other year is going to be a drought year, and a 24% chance would be every three years, every fourth year is a drought year. And then we set the drought year intensity. So we created these raster layers um, of precipitation, of mean daily precipitation across the Coweta Basin. And then we set that intensity to be either 5, 15, 25, or 30 percent drier than the 30-year mean, so that we have this kind of scaling of drought intensity. So then we had the model draw a random number from 0 to 1. If that number was greater than the drought probability, then we applied the raster that has the 30-year mean conditions, so these sort of normal precipitation conditions. If the random number that's drawn is less than the drought probability, then we would apply the raster layer of drought conditions that we set, either the 5, 15, 25, or 35 percent drier. <clears throat> and then that precipitation value gets fed into those logistic equations, remember, from those little plots for each size class. And then we would have this survival equation for each size class that's based on precipitation that's set for that particular year. Okay, so that's what I just said. It comes from the Bayesian Robust Design Model, and they're these size class specific weather mediated survival estimates. We also use that adult survival estimate with those static, unchanging, deterministic um, fecundity values to calculate a fecundity rate for each year. And those come from the clutch size and clutch frequency that we estimated in the fecundity study and from the mean hatch rate in the literature. <coughs> Okay, so then we plug all of this into this matrix, which is the same kind of matrix that I described before, but because it's stochastic, now we have these variable um, survival rates each year depending on the precipitation. But I did highlight this in red. This is, this, this is the rate at which new hatchlings are produced by adults, right? And it's highlighted in red because it's not as variable as it would be in reality, because we don't know how clutch size varies with precipitation levels, and we don't know how clutch frequency varies, and we're not really confident about hatch rate, right? So we just left it as sort of this constant fecundity, even though we know that it's variable. So that does not include as much variation as it should. And then this matrix is run for every year in every raster, cell, and it calculates lambda for every cell. And so it runs for 100 iterations in 50 years. So there's 100 times 50 runs, you know. Anyway, so you get this, you get this cycling through this system, and what it produces are these, mean, uh, are these mean growth rates at these different cells across these uh, rasters of different drynesses with, that are run with different drought probabilities. Okay, so down here, we have the 35% dry or 50% drought probability. This is the worst, most awful situation. And up here, we have the 30-year mean. So there's no droughts at all happening up there. It's the 30-year mean every year. So this is the most awesome situation. Um, but we, as you can see, we're never getting a growth rate that's below 1. So that means even at these really severe, crappy drought situation, you know, the Coweta Basin is still predicted to have population growth rates that are increasing. So we think this probably is not 100% accurate. Um, and it probably has to do with the fact that we're not letting fecundity vary as precipitation varies. If we did, I'm sure we would see a decline in clutch size and clutch frequency and probably hatch rate also. And so then populations might decline when things get drier. So we wanted to see if we know the magnitude of those population growth rates. It's probably a little bit wacky. But we think that this, the gradient of values across the precipitation gradient in Coweta is probably accurate. So we do think that population growth is higher over here and lower over here because 
it's much drier over here and it's much wetter over here, right? So we turned to our abundance estimates and we sought to compare them to these projected population growth rates. And so the circles here um, show total abundance at each of these points, total predicted abundance. And then we stuck on there these pie charts showing the size class breakdown at each of these sites. And so what you can see is over here in these dry sites, you have that typical 50% of the population is adults, right? Whereas over here, it's pretty wet and you've got about equal proportions of each size class. And down here in our two wettest areas, you actually have more juveniles and hatchlings and many fewer adults and subadults. So population structure is really different depending on how dry or wet sites are, it looks like. And it also seems like the predicted abundance is gelling with this mean population growth rate that we've predicted. If population growth rate is higher, then abundance also appears to be higher. So then we took it one step further and we projected this over the county-wide level. <coughs> And again, even though we predicted, we worked with this really severe drought scenario, we still really didn't get any places where population growth declined, which is pretty surprising because, I don't know, I would have thought over here in this pretty dry area, you know, I would have thought there would be population decline, but there's not. And again, this probably seems like it's a result of that fecundity term not varying with precipitation. So I think this, this, that these maps are a good representation of the variation in population growth rates across the landscape, but I don't think it's a terribly good estimator of the magnitude of those population growth rates. So what, is the, what did we actually find out in these studies? Well, we found that 28-day survival is sensitive to fine scale variation in mean daily precipitation rates, and that this sensitivity is higher in smaller size classes. We found that adult survival, clutch frequency, hatch rate, and hatchling survival are the most sensitive rates. And that mean stochastic lambda is greater than one across the entire landscape, even in the most severe drought scenarios that we tested. But again, we did not let all our fecundity terms vary with precipitation, so that's not particularly realistic, and we're, we're not really stuck on the magnitude. We are just kind of looking at the, at the variability. Um, and then we estimated a, our estimated abundance and estimated population growth across the Coweta Basin correlate pretty strongly. Okay, so then, we moved on to the next chapter, which is how do local stakeholder perceptions of steep slope development compare with perspectives of the scientific community in the Southern Appalachian Mountains? So this might seem like a really big jump from what we've been talking about, but in the ICOM program, um, we try to look at conservation issues from multiple perspectives or with multiple ways of knowing and through multiple lenses. And so in addition to the ecological models and forecasts that we made based on the ecological data, which are super exciting and fun, um, we also need to consider that the Southern Appalachians are a rapidly developing human system and that human values and perceptions are going to influence the success of any conservation efforts that occur there. So what do we typically study when we look at the connections between human and natural systems? Well, here's a list of the kind of human dimensions that you might think about. There's institutions, which are, they can be things like conservation organizations, they can be things like government agencies that do conservation. Um, we also think, can think about markets, you know, something like a real estate market can really drive development in an area, where it occurs and how rapidly it occurs. Um, government agencies have a big part to play in this and regulatory systems as well. And also the use of natural resources by humans and the anthropogenic disturbances that they create. And in natural systems, we have ecosystems which contain processes and materials, fluxes. We also have communities and populations of wildlife and plants. And we also have natural disturbance regimes. And so what's commonly examined is the use of natural resources by people and how anthropogenic disturbances and those natural resource uses affect natural systems. And then sometimes what people look at is this feedback to the effects of of anthropogenic processes on natural systems, how that affects ecosystem services that people rely on, like clean water or um, clean air or you know scenic amenities, like nice places to go hiking and things like that. So that's typically kind of what people look at. But in coupled human and natural systems, like the exurbanizing Southern Appalachians, and exurbanization is this process where people from urban centers move to rural areas in search of natural amenities, like views or recreation opportunities, things like that. Um, you really have these, these more complex relationships and a lot of times the relationships are reciprocal. So things that happen in one system are going to produce an effect in the other system and there will usually be some kind of feedback as well. So we looked at, this is sort of like an exercise in looking at what's going on in this situation, right? With this human system and the natural system and this steep slope development process. So we know that there's a weak regulatory environment in the Southern Appalachians for a number of reasons. Some of them are cultural. Um, 
And there's also this really strong real estate market. And both of those things are driving steep slope development because there's no limitation on it and because people want to live on these steep slopes where they have scenic views um, and that sort of thing. So we know that steep slope development affects um, forest cover, it reduces it because forests are being cleared to develop houses and put in roads. We know that it creates ultra disturbance regimes um, and it also can lead to non-native species introductions. So this is a big addition I just made, sorry about that. Um, but you have reduced forest cover is creating altered microclimates. So when you remove the forest, the soil dries faster, things like that. Um, it also can produce erosion because when you remove trees and plants, soils are not held down and they tend to slide down the hill. Um, and it can also produce directly ter degraded terrestrial and aquatic habitat. <clears throat> and then these altered disturbance regimes, we had fire suppression there for a really long time and it's still really a fire suppressed environment. So like last fall there was a pretty severe drought, or no, the fall before, that's a two years ago now. Anyway, there was a pretty severe drought and we had these really awful wildfires and they just burned the crap out of things because there, was, there had been this suppressed um, fire situation and so you had these high fuel loads and so on and so forth. And so when you have those really severe fires, they can lead to worse stream sedimentation and erosion and things like that. Additionally, landslides can be caused by disturbances on steep slopes. That's something that's actually been shown. Um, and then these non-native species introductions, you can think of things like the hemlock woolly adelgid that has killed off all the hemlock trees in the southern Appalachians or the chestnut blight much earlier in the century, um, which killed off all the chestnuts. And so these non-native species introductions can really change the forest environment and they can affect both the terrestrial and aquatic habitat and the net outcome of all this is that you get this reduced biodiversity but now we really want to think about okay so this stuff is is being studied by people by scientists in the region quite a lot right but what about these kinds of processes where things feed back into the human system so we know that landslides lead to loss of life and property and some people have looked at how that loss of life and property can affect the weak regulatory environment it can create this momentum for regulations to be passed or at least generated um, and we also know that stream sedimentation and things like that produce reduced water quality and altered hydrology, which can create flood hazards for people, and they can also create, you know, reduced drinking water quality. Um, and then we suspect that, you know, degraded terrestrial and aquatic habitat and reduced biodiversity can reduce recreation opportunities for people. And so there are these sort of speculative arrows where we can say, you know, these things may affect the real estate market eventually because they're taking away the sort of natural and scenic amenities that are in this place that people want and why they're moving there, right? So. <clears throat> Let's see. Wait, wait, I think I missed something. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, so so scientists at the Coweta LTER, which is located in Macon County and which is where we work, um, have really been studying a lot of the things that are that are in the black arrows, right? But some of these things that, that are marked by the gray arrows or the gray text are things that haven't been looked at very extensively. So there have been some studies on the real estate market and there have been studies on the weak regulatory environment, but there haven't been, as far as I know, studies that connect things like these reduced um, ecosystem services to a decline in the real estate market or some other kind of final negative feedback loop. So a little bit more about Macon County real quick. There are 34,000 people that live there. It's located in the Blue Ridge Physiographic Province. It has a total area of 520 square miles. About half of it is privately owned and about half of it is owned by the USDA Forest Service. That's kind of a lot, you know, to have 50% of your county landscape owned by the Forest Service. That's this huge amount of public land that anybody can go and access. So that's kind of amazing. Um, and then there's a little bit that's owned by the state and a little bit that's owned by the counties, by the county and by the towns. <coughs> so, in order to figure out what's going on here with how people think about steep slope development, how stakeholders think about it, um, we did this archival research. So I went and I read um, all these back issues of the Franklin Press newspaper. And because this is a small community with poor internet access, this paper newspaper still kind of matters in that place, which is nice. Um, and then I also read the news sections of the Cherokee One Feather newspaper. So I went back and I read about seven years of these newspapers. I also conducted some targeted interviews with individuals in the county that are known to be knowledgeable about land use and conservation. And I also did this participatory mapping study. So I held five mapping events that were open to the public and I had participants draw on maps where they actually in the spatial landscape, in the spatial world on the landscape wanted to see a set of their top five land uses occur. <clears throat> and so then, I'm trying to say, okay, how did the focus, the foci of scientists compare to the primary stakeholder interests, right? So we started with the archival research and I coded the articles by the subject matter they contained. So sometimes multiple codes were assigned to each article. And what I came up with was, you know, that economic impacts are by far what stakeholders are concerned about, much more so than things like ecological concerns or water quality, right? So 
interviews also confirmed this. You know, some of the interviewees said, you know, people are not going to care about anything but the economy until they have better jobs or until they're not struggling financially, right? And in, I mean, sure, ecology is important, but you can't get people to care about it if they can't put dinner on the table, you know? And additionally, people said, one of you interviewees said, look, if you want to argue for regulation, you have to make it an economic argument. If you can set that before people, then they'll say, okay, sure, that makes sense. But any other argument doesn't really seem to matter to them. <coughs> And if we compare this to what scientists in the region are studying, you know, there's this huge amount of research that's going on with these sort of ecological concerns, right? But if you compare that to what people are thinking, people, stakeholders in the region, they don't really care about the ecological concerns, right? That's really not very high on their radar. So that's a pretty significant disconnect right there. <clears throat> Similarly, you know, there's some research happening with reduced water quality and altered hydrology, but that's really not a big concern to people there either. Um, and also, you know, what is a concern, these economic impacts and the impacts on the real estate market and things like that, that's only marginally sort of being studied. There have been a couple papers that I've read about it. Um, and finally, you know, people seem to be really concerned about you know, that, that some people in the county don't want regulation to happen and that there are local officials who are trying to make regulation not happen because it benefits their businesses, like their land surveying businesses or their real estate businesses. And so those kinds of things seem to really concern people. But there's really not much being done on that in the research either. Um, so those, those are pretty significant disconnects. Also, we found that in our mapping assess or in our mapping project, um, participants assigned uses across an elevation gradient, obviously, because the landscape is topographically complex. So here we have all the different land uses that people assigned, and here we have the mean elevation of those uses. So it does seem like, you know, development uses are being assigned at lower elevations. So maybe people are really spatially connecting, look, we don't really like steep slope development or we're really concerned about it, so let's put development at lower elevations. Maybe that is something that people are doing. Um, and then you see these sort of preserves and wilderness areas and um, recreation and things like that are happening, are happening up here at these higher elevations predominantly. There aren't a lot of those down at the lower elevations. So maybe people are saying, okay, look, let's put uses on the landscape at these high elevation areas where there are steep slopes that aren't going to potentially damage those slopes or you know, sediment streams or things like that. Maybe people are thinking about that. We're not really sure because our sample size for this project was really small. We only had 17 participants, um, and they weren't really very demographically representative. They were all white. Um, they were all over 65. I think one of them grew up in the county, but the rest of them were people who had moved from somewhere else. Um, and by and large, they all were much more affluent and better educated than people in the county on average. So they weren't a very representative sample, which is you know, there's not a whole lot you can say then about what the county people, what people in the county really think. But this subset of people, you know, marked uses in this particular way, and it may reflect something um, about the county as a whole, potentially. So this crazy thing is all of the, all of the marks that people drew on maps, right? So uh, can you guys see this? I don't know if you can see this um, legend over here. It looks pretty small. But basically what I tried to do is these these pink values are things like conservation easements, preserves, um, passive and extractive recreation activities. Um, these light yellow colors are things like national forests, national parks. Um, this orange color is wild wilderness areas. And then, let's see, the purple color is agriculture, and the blue colors are development. Um, and then I think this pale green, which probably looks like yellow to you, unfortunately, um, those are recreation uses exclusively. And so. This is kind of interesting then because you can sort of see that there are big areas where people want to see potentially these sort of preserve or conservation or, or you know, public ownership activities happening. It kind of seems like a big part of this area over here, people really want to see those kind of more conservation friendly uses. And maybe a little bit here too in this township. Um, and then it seems like there's a bunch of development up here, and there's a significant amount of development here. And interestingly, this is the, this is the 441 corridor that runs right up through this part of the county. So it, that may be why people put development there, because there may already be quite a bit in that area. So 
we wanted to know, you know, just sort of qualitatively, aren't there any intersections between how people valued the land for conservation uses and what we projected for salamander habitat? And it looks like potentially, yeah, sure, there could be, because like I said, these areas over here seem to be ascribed pretty predominantly to these sort of preserve or conservation friendly uses. And that corresponds to this area here, which is Coweta, this hyper wet area where we know it's really great for salamanders. Um, and additionally, over here in the Highlands Township, it seems like there are a lot of those kind of preserve and recreation uses being assigned. And again, it's pretty wet there. Um, and interestingly, up here where it's drier and it's probably not so great for salamanders, that's where you're seeing a lot of these kind of broken up smaller uses and a lot of development happening, or recommended, I guess, is what I should say. So even though we can't say, yeah, 100% this is what's happening up there, this is what people think, and you know, we can tell you for sure that here's good salamander habitat and here's what people think, and so you should definitely conserve like this area, right? We can't say that because we had a small sample size, it wasn't very representative, but I think it shows that this method, this participatory mapping method, really has potential to tell you something important if you can get people to participate at a, at a greater frequency or a higher rate. Um, okay, so that's, that's about it. Um, I wanted to thank Kira McIntyre, my compatriot up there in the awful nighttime field work for um, being such a great project co-leader, everybody who helped us out in the field. And um, this is an Aeneides, and he's super happy because now this is over. <laughs> hey, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I, I appreciate the fact that, that it wasn't possible to kind of link kind of to rainfall. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I think, if I recall correctly, most of your fecundity terms had empirical variation from your they study. They did. The only the, uh, the exception was hatch rate, was mm -hmm. that right? Was, and so was that, did you put that so, in as a fixed? No, so clutch <laughs> frequency, clutch frequency I only have one value for, mm -hmm. right? But but clutch size, there's a lot of variation. So, so yes, I did include, and I simplified these methods a little bit just in the interest of time. But yeah, in that model, you know, we used the standard deviation for the rates where we had standard deviation to draw a random error term in every iteration. So, and how about those rates where you didn't have standard deviation? Yeah, so like for, for clutch frequency, we made it a standard deviation of 0.1, I think is what we set it to. So that there is some variation that's added in there, but it's not, it's random, you know, it's not really related to precipitation and it's sort of artificial and arbitrary in some cases, so. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, even if you don't have a relationship to precipitation, I mean, you could, it sounds like you did put a little bit of variation. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one, one you know, common strategy would be to do something like if if it's like a, a proportion term, like like uh, like like, uh, um, like frequency. Um, mm -hmm. Is it point five seven or something like that? It's point four two two. I think is the clutch frequency. Uh, anyway, it, it, it's you know you make a like a argue that it's a, a Bernoulli draw of some kind. Mm -hmm. well, that has a that kind of has a variation that that's that's. Uh, you know, lacking any other information, it's reasonable to use the p times one minus p okay. argument for, <laughs> for the variation term for that and sample from that. And and so, lacking other information, you know, you might that might be a reasonable thing to do. Okay. That's, that it, it is a little concerning that no matter what what scenario you threw at it, you know, all the the, um, the, the lambdas are greater than yeah. one. You know, um, so um, um, I, I guess if I can follow up does this does this i mean it sat it when, when i look at your the, the map and I'm, I'm thinking back to the the figure where you have the um you have the, the population distribution um the, the so, so it's the age distribution uh sensitive to elevation and maybe the probably the, the anticipation precipitation gradient or something like that um it, it Right, right back there. Yeah. This yeah, one. That one right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, are have you thought about um, uh, doing any 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 spatial modeling on that? I mean, th this this looks more like a, this almost looks metapopulation-ish, like those like those drier yeah. plants constantly twinking out and maybe possibly rescued when you get. Uh, you know, good year <coughs> rainfall or something like that. And, 
I do think that's a possibility. Um, the one thing is that these guys don't move a lot. Like their home ranges are kind of like, they're estimated to be less than five square meters, you know? So if they're not moving a lot, then I'm not sure what the capacity is to rescue dry populations when, you know, it almost seems like we have, oops, gosh dang it. Like it almost seems like we have kind of like a threshold here, you know, like above this precipitation band here, you know, we're getting really good populations, really stable growing populations. But sort of uh, below this band, like it's really crappy, you know. And so it just makes me wonder, like how much dispersal is really possible? I mean, maybe right at the threshold, sure. But beyond that, I, I just don't know. I don't have a good sense of that. I mean, it would be something that would be really cool to model for right, sure. So, or maybe they, they respond in episodic types of sure. recruitment where yeah. in, in good conditions they they go to town. <laughs> yeah, um, like if, if hatchlings can make it this year then they really make it yeah. or something. There's also these little pockets of coves in those mm. areas, right? So at a finer resolution there could be little tiny pockets of very wet habitat in otherwise really dry sections of landscape. And so I think those coves could be source habitats. For these wider, drier landscapes. I think that's particularly possible. Like in this watershed, there happens to be a little ravine off to the side of our sites, where, and that's one of the few places I've ever seen salamanders in that watershed, is in that little ravine. So that may be really possible. Question? Yeah. What was your precipitation data source? You had a, did you have a different one in soil moisture? Did they come from different? Yeah, so we used, um, we used the PRISM climate groups data, um, but we also were lucky enough to have access to actual precipitation data recorded in the Coweta Basin at an automatic recording rain gauge. So we had this rain data source right next to our capture mark recapture plots, and then there were a set of rain gauges, I think five or six of them, around the basin. So we were able to kind of use those for predictively in the model, and then we wanted to project over the landscape, we used the PRISM data set to get the continuous layer. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jillian. We'll take a quick comment.